States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion right then. First and so second. All right. Uh, is there any further discussion? Uh, hearing none. This is, I guess, set up as a roll call vote. So Christensen's absent right now. Hope for yes. Meyer. Yes. Barson. Yes. Survival absent. Reichman. Yes. Lewisburg absent. Motion carries. I guess we'll go right into the food service, Mr. Reichman. Yep, I'm going to stop sharing. So Janine or Paula can share. I'll turn over to them. But um, in essence, I want to thank our food service people. Um, these, especially our two ladies here today that oversaw it all, then uh, our, our whole kitchen staff. They served over 30,000 meals on distance learning. And I think people forget that we put a new serving line in last year. We increased the opportunities and options available at the 712 building and the elementary. We trained in um, new head cooks in every building. And I believe we transitioned head cooks at Starbucks. Uh, we started with a new person and had a new a new head cook, uh, I think partially through the year. Um, I want to say thanks. I think our food service has gone extremely well tomorrow. Tonight, later on, you're going to hear about the budget. You know, I, we do believe we'll still end in the year in the black uh, in food service. Uh, the concern is we don't really know what it looks like last year. I think one of the things that I would tee up is that there's a lot of interesting things happening with what people, everyone's pivoting to the fall now. What will fall look like? Um, so before I talk fall, I'd say, first of all, thanks for this last year. Um, we currently, we would currently, we would continue to serve meals. However, the issue would be is we don't have staff and kids can get meals in our community. And I'd say recap of this spring is that we are probably serving 50% of our, our student population average. So some people were concerned that maybe we weren't reaching as many people, um, but I don't know what we could have done differently. So um, without any further ado, I'll stop sharing with Gordon, Janine, and Paulette. All right, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And Paulette and myself are co-presenting here. So um, let me see here. There we go. So anyways, uh, thank you so much for letting us present to you tonight. Um, just uh, how the year went, and especially the last part of the year, and just a little bit of what we're looking at going forward. It's like uh, Chip said, it's kind of hard to plan, um, not knowing exactly what is needed. We do know that whatever the choices are, we're going to have to probably scramble, just like all of you. Um, but we'll get into that in a little bit. So. I'd like to start off with actually Paulette just talking about the year and how it went. Yeah. Do you want me to share my screen, Janine? Oh, I'll share mine. I'll keep going here. Okay. Oh, if I could figure out. There we go. I should be sharing my screen. Am I not? No, you're not. Uh -uh. Oh, sorry. Let me try it again. Uh, I forgot one one little step. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Awesome. Um, so just a real quick year in review. Um, Chip mentioned you know some new staff. So at the elementary school, we started the year with one new staff member. Um, working out really well. Very flexible. Um, hard worker. She was one of the front people to go jump on the bus to help do some deliveries, very fun to work with. Over at the high school, we started the year with a couple new staff members. We uh, actually increased our staffing there, thought that the need for one new staff member because their numbers have gone up so much that they, they needed additional all hands on to be able to create all the meals that they do and then to work their a la carte, which is going really well. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. When when came off to a kind of a little rocky start trying to get a manager in there. We went through a couple. Um, I think they got a little scared, but ended up with an exceptional manager now that um, cares deeply about.
of those students and you can tell the, the quality is there. The kids look forward to coming down to practice and lunch, so that was huge. Um, also worked getting some student helpers there, working a little bit more towards job skills, more, so, more than just helping in the kitchen, developing some, some skills that they can use out in the real world. So we kind of put this with, together a little bit of a program for them, did some training, some food safety training, and some of that filtered then one gal that started at when she actually went over then when she transitioned back to high school, continued on over at the high school. So I'd love to be able to see that continue for next year. Um, and you would just, again, continue to focus on quality, just keeping that quality improving as we go, um, <clears throat> making sure that, you know, we're putting out nice, nutritious, hot food for all of our students. One of our focuses was uh, more farm to school partnerships. You may have seen a lot of fresh produce on the menu this year, highlighting some different things. Um, Buttercup squash was one that one comes to mind. That was a really fun share that came from one of our local partners in there. And we also implemented share carts to help decrease some of the waste that, you know, we hate to say that there's waste, but we know there is. Students are expected to take certain components. They don't always want to eat them. Well, some students might not be able to go buy a la carte, but boy, that extra apple or that extra banana might be really great for them. So that enabled them to do it. Obviously, with COVID, that was pulled right away. Uh, so we're hoping at one point we'll be able to do that again. The a la carte line I really wanted to really talk about a little more so. Get an update, and my our staff surprised us on this one. I came in for a visit, and they're like, you gotta come look, you gotta come look, you gotta see this. They, and I'm probably gonna start to cry because it just touches my heart so much, um, they pulled their money to give the a la carte line an update. Had no idea they were gonna do this. Just a beautiful paint job, they did some um, aluminum style trim work and stuff just to give it a little bit more brightness to it. The staff there really cares. They really build um, great staff. So, I'm going to stop right there with that one because I will be a bawling little girl in a moment. Um, but with that, um, Janine, I'll have you go to the next slide, please. COVID curveball. That kind of hit us all on there. So we went into pickup and delivery meals. We started up with just some pickup right away. So we had pickup available at the elementary over at Starbucks. Uh, families had to register for their delivery. We did pretty much door-to-door -door deliveries. Some of those rural sites with those really long driveways, our gals were in there in the vans right up to the doorstep bringing meals to them. So what did that look like? How, our numbers just said we did about 33,000, if you would advance. We did 33,400 meals total between our delivery and our curbside pickup. It's a lot of meals. That's an awful lot for um, everyone to be coordinating. It is less than our normal participation, and we will talk about that in a little bit. That's kind of what it looks like, though, getting ready to put out three days' worth of meals. Um, we were delivering three days at one time and two days at another time. Next slide. So our curbside, we averaged about 234 meals per day. So that's breakfast and lunch at the two locations. So the combined two and the delivery, we were averaging about 534 meals per day. It got off to a slower start. At the end, we were averaging about 600 meals per day. So it kind of up a little bit, a little bit. And said Monday to Wednesday. Couple pictures of the staff getting ready for things, getting buses loaded to get those meals out. Um, I believe that Nate did some music as the students and parents were picking up meals over at the elementary school. And Starbucks uh, just really attests to how much she cares about her students. It was May Day and she couldn't let it go without some kind of a treat. So her and the para that was helping her out of their own budget again made May baskets to hand out to all the students. Um, very, very sweet and really shows how much <laughs> she really cares about them. Okay, I'm gonna, Janine's gonna talk about some of the revenue right there. Yeah, the big red staring at us in the face, right? Um, like Chip said, you know, what else could we do to encourage families? We made it very, very easy for them, and I know the whole district uh, 
try hard to get the word out there. And for whatever reason, it just wasn't picked up on. So just to remind you, we have a self-sustaining department. So we don't draw off the general fund. We do rely on our sales to pay our staff, make sure we provide food, make sure we can get our equipment, et cetera. I know COVID hit all of us, but just to let you know how it affected us, we're down about 900 meals a day. And of course, we had zero a la carte revenue. And over the course between March and the end of the school year, we were down about $135,000, a little over that in revenue. Now that's not profit, that's just revenue, but it definitely does affect our contribution to our fund balance at the end of the year, which is what we used to do. Of course, those projects like the makeover at the high school and new equipment that they needed actually for food safety reasons more than anything. All right. We do have a three-year plan. And even though we're all dealing with COVID issues, we still are gonna stay on our plan. We feel pretty positive that no matter what style of feeding we do, whether it's in the classroom or it's modified cafeteria, or maybe it's just even some delivery mixed in, we wanna go forward with our plan. So we're on track. Might have to make it look a little different in how we execute, but it's still the plan. Paulette, you wanna talk about this slide? Yeah, so what are we looking at for the 2021 school year to kind of get off to a start? We're gonna continue with our food philosophy. We had mentioned that in the fall that we were targeting sugar in the fall, really decreasing the amount of items like the fruit juice and how often that's on the menu and with milk. And now we're venturing more into taking a look at some of our items, taking a look at artificial colors, flavors, any type of additives, and trying to replace items that have a lot of these with more whole foods, which goes into our menu where we're looking at doing a lot more scratch cooking. We do quite a bit already. Our goal is minimum three scratch items. Honestly, we've exceeded that already with our targeted menu for the fall. We're up to sometimes as many as five scratch, not just quick scratch, scratch items, items that the staff are making just like you would at home. We're looking at more baking, actual baking of the breads and the muffins that will go along with some of our menus. Excuse me. For staff development, we would like to look at adding an assistant manager to the high school. Her volume and their program could really support and have the youth want to really help with continuing the program and the support process they've made already. We'll be looking at some different technology things. These were actually staff requests from them wanting to learn a little bit more about technology. Also some cross training. Our managers are gonna look at swapping jobs and going from one school to another and see how another school does it. And then that would be, I'm sorry, job swapping. And then cross training, making sure everyone can do every position. So if somebody's out absent, you can move easily into another one. You may have heard us already talk about the wellness committee. We're continuing that. We've had a couple of meetings so far, so we'll be pursuing that more, getting the committee really developed on that. Good news, the triennial assessment that would have been due this year, we have gotten a waiver. So it has, now we can do it next year. So that gives a little bit more time to prepare, get through the COVID and go through there. As part of the wellness committee, one of the initiatives that we'll be looking at is hydration stations in the kitchen. So the students have some more water options, whether they're just the simple food flavored water, those types of items. And then just really working towards incorporating the wellness culture into the school, really working with that. Equipment needs, sorry, I don't have my glasses on. Equipment needs, we were hoping to look at a new line and new combi for the elementary school. That's gonna be on hold for a little bit. We need to let some of that fund balance build back up again. And then when, I know Chip, this is one you would like to see done too. We would still love to see a school garden. So that's still in the back of our minds. So that's kind of the momentum that we're looking at and kind of where we're looking forward to going to in 2021 school year. 
I feel like I got the short end of the stick having to talk about money all the time. <laughs> well, well, I don't get to talk about the fun stuff. Uh, Vicki, I know how you feel. <laughs> um, so we are proposing a 10 cent increase on lunches next year. Of course, breakfast right now, well, for this past year, was free to all students. A uh, 10 cent increase um, gets us about $16,000 extra revenue, which is a 2% increase in our total revenue. Just of note, though, salaries, fringe, and food cost increases alone are going to be about 20000 a little over $20,000. Um, this is a phenomenon all schools face, and you probably too with the general budget. Um, the reimbursements from federal and state just do not keep up with inflation, and so unless they increase um, or we do a major price increase on our on our meals, we're going to see this, and eventually we won't be able to contribute to our fund balance at some point in time. Um, you know, that's the future. So we want to make sure that we are increasing our meal prices annually, so we don't ever have to do a big increase on our meals. It's it's pretty well known that anytime you increase prices, you're going to lose a little bit of participation. Um, however, we just can't not increase our meal prices. So I'm going to ask the board if you would consider a 10 cent meal price increase. You know, with COVID and how it's affected our families, and we know families are suffering. Um, just to put it into perspective, for a full pay family who's not on benefits, that makes about $17 a year for that 10 cent increase. And when you look at it that way, I don't think it would have a severe impact, financial impact on families who are full pay. Um, we do expect to see an increase in our free and reduced lunches um, and get more applications this year. Paulette also talked about increasing our the quality of our meals, and we do want to do more and more scratch cooking. So we are looking at the possibility, depending on where the budget goes, if we have to go that route, we would have to add hours to our staff. This would be, instead of buying prepackaged foods like um, certain breakfast breads, and it's, it's a lot of baked goods actually, we would just make them from scratch. Uh, it's better for the kids, there's less preservatives, less artificial stuff in them, they taste better, of course we all know that. That's a direction we would like to start going next year, and that is on our three year plan. Um, I don't have a slide for this, but we do, we have talked about what are we going to do next year, and I know we, even you guys don't know, uh, but Paulette and I have talked about the scenarios of if we have to have the kids eat in the classroom, we'd have to buy a transport equipment, if they do come through the cafeteria, we'd have to have plexiglass, Spiders, um, probably look at the, the chip cards instead of kids actually touching the pin pads and use those swipe cards um, to have them enter their number. So there will be a cost, and it's going to take some time to get those things in place. So hopefully, an answer comes soon. And we've also talked about the hybrid of maybe kids going to school every other day. What does that look like? Do we send meals home with them for the next day that they are going to be staying home? So we're just kind of ready and waiting and putting some contingency plans in place for that. <clears throat> I wanted to share, this is the last slide, and I'd just like you to consider this. We do give all students free breakfast. Now, free and reduced students, if they qualify, they get a free breakfast regardless. We are feeding our paid students for free. And the average daily breakfast reimbursement based on average daily breakfast participation is about 180,000, almost 181,000. It costs us a food cost of 125,000 and our labor cost for breakfast is about 100,000. So you can see that we really don't make money on breakfast. Um, it seems like we would, you know, based off of the reimbursements that we get, but just with the cost of labor and food, and they're rising, by the way, I usually budget a 3% food cost increase. This year it needs to be at least four. The food chain supply is getting better, but it has issues, and it will continue to have sustaining issues 
even into the fall. And we have been told that meal price increases, or I'm sorry, food cost increases will increase. I said that wrong, but you know what I'm talking about. Of course, the unknown is if we have paid kids pay for their breakfast, will they even want breakfast? We don't know that. I'm pretty sure we'll see our participation go down. But most of the kids that we feed for breakfast are not free and reduced students. They are paid students, and it's a great service we provide. It's just something to consider as we look at the cost of doing business going down the road. Is this something we'd like to continue as a service? So just throwing it out there for information right now. But that pretty much concludes where we were, where we are, and kind of where we're going. I guess we all don't know where we're going yet. We're waiting in place. I'm sure we'll all be scrambling. But it was a good year, and I really want to thank Paulette. She amazingly stepped up during this COVID time frame and just took over with planning because we had two districts to plan for. And thank you, Paulette, so much for the job you did. You did outstanding. Thank you. On behalf of the board, I said it a couple months ago, but I really appreciate all the work your staff has done, yourselves. It was pretty masterful coordination to be able to deliver all these meals during the day. And that's something that we've had to adapt in all departments, and you guys have certainly stepped up to the challenge as well. I'll open it up to the board for any comments or questions. Just from my kids' perspective, the meal quality has been fantastic since you guys got on board, and they actually enjoy eating school lunches again. So thank you for that. I mean, it's not a big surprise, but it's good feedback. Yeah, that's what I would just agree with Chad. The same thing. You know, eight years ago, food topic was always a negative topic, and you guys have just done an outstanding job. My kids have said it's more like eating at restaurants. You know, that's the caliber that they said that they get to go to lunch, and it's like going to a restaurant. So that's pretty impressive. So thank you guys. Good job, folks. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move on to item number six, which is the summer 2020 activities and community ed programs. Mr. Chair, opening scene. Is it the screen here with him? Yes. Okay. So there were a couple of meetings that took place in the last probably two weeks. They basically came up with guidelines that allow the reopening based on the National Federation of High School Associations, the State High School League, Sports Med, Department of Health, NDE. And there are parameters that allow you to reopen your facilities if you can meet these guidelines. I sat and read the six-day meeting with all the area superintendents and ADs. You know, I would say everybody is looking at it differently depending on their facilities. We are lucky that we do have pretty awesome facilities. So I met with Bill and all the head coaches last Monday to talk about what it could look like here. I met with Bill two weeks ago about how it could work here. There's a lot of stipulations. This is more advisory for the board. What we're going to do is we need to pass. We passed summer programming, but we're going to scale it down immensely. So what you're going to see in Bill's area is Laker Legends, which he'll talk a little bit about because it's not just about speed and strength and opening the high school activities and athletics, but community education. You're seeing the budget is your deficit coming from a deficit from activities and community ed. So how could this look different going forward? So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Bill. I've asked Bill, Megan, and Jeremy Christensen to come forward about what this and how this would look like on the lens of community ed and activities. So let's talk about – Bill, I'd like for you to talk about Laker Legends first because that's already happening. Right. Laker Legends, when we started two years ago, what is this? I think our third summer. 
Third Somerville? Correct. Yep. And it started, yep, it started yesterday. We had everything put in place on Monday. It got going yesterday for the first time. Obviously, today was day two. It's out here at the high school right now because they are going through an asbestos abatement at the elementary, so they're going to be here for at least two weeks. I think two weeks is probably going to be the length of it here, and then they will move back to the elementary school at that time. Looks like it's got off to a good start. They're kind of, I guess, for lack of a better word, they're kind of the guinea pigs in getting started in regards to using all the COVID-19 protocol. They've got everything in place that they need in place. All of the participants' parents were notified. They got all the lists and all the accommodating things that need to be done in order to do that. Our maintenance staff has done a very, very good job in preparing for that, and this is just the first step of trying to offer activities, which we said we were going to do at Laker Lenses to start with, and I think it's off to a pretty good start here after two days. As far as other things, I'll stay in the community vein just for a second before we get into athletics and activities. Whatever we do from this point on in regards to activities, or excuse me, community education programs or summer recreation for that matter, would not begin until July 6th. There will be nothing that goes on in that regard other than perhaps registration for those activities if we can figure out exactly how they're going to work out. But if we do that, it would be a four-week program that would start right after the 4th of July and run through the month of July, very similar to what we would usually do in June, but with everything going on here with the virus and the preventative measures and all those types of things, we thought the best thing to do would be to wait until July 6th. Most of the other schools, districts as far as summer rec and community education, I know Alexandria is already, I think, going to get going with some things next week, but most of the schools in our conference and schools in this area are waiting until after the 4th of July holiday to do something in the month of July. So we all know, obviously, we've been through this for almost three months now. Things can change on a moment's notice. They have. They probably will, hopefully. We'll get through everything without any issues this summer. But as far as summer rec and other community education programs, right now, none of those things would take place until after July 1st and after the 4th of July holiday. So Monday, July 6th would be the start date for those things. We have some things yet to work out in that regard. As far as activities and athletics, as the superintendent mentioned, we did have a couple of meetings. We met last Friday and then again this Monday. They were fruitful meetings. The superintendent was part of the first one. I was bored with how the second one went because he was up at Camp Ripley, obviously. It got a lot accomplished, I thought, during the course of those two meetings. Both of them lasted about a couple hours to two and a half hours, talking about how we could implement our activities programming with our athletes. And this is going to be different. This is not something we've gone through ever, right? Obviously, we're all going through some of these things for the first time. But the league did finally give permission to open things up from a school perspective in regards to athletics on the 15th of June. Most of the schools are going to begin at that point. There are some schools that finish their school year in June that have decided not to start until after the 4th of July. But the vast majority are going to go on the 15th, especially those schools who finish in May, such as we did. So we sat down, and the emphasis really, and I'll turn it over to Jeremy, too, and he can speak to this. The emphasis really is around our strength and speed training. That is going to be the first and foremost thing that we focused on. After we get that taken care of, then we can move on and try to put these athletes into their various activities that they're a part of, whether it's basketball, whether it's volleyball, whether it's football, whatever it might be. And that's going to be different because once we put these kids into these various groups, which are going to be called – What's that? I'm not trying to cut you off, but no, we're not. We're going to focus on speed and strength. That's what you're saying. Right, yeah, that's what I'm – That's all – Right, no, that's right. Get out of the crowd. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, focus on speed and strength. I'm saying you're trying to help in that tonight. It's not even an option. Based on the state high school team, right now, our focus is on providing one program that Bill will oversee intensely to make sure it's successful. And so when I see things popping up of volunteer basketball, volunteer baseball, one of the problems and the foundation of all this, the reason I'm being a jerk about it is there is no commingling. Once we put it under our hood, our lens, there is no commingling. Meaning that Tyson Meyer, if he wants to go play – if he's doing speed and strength and he wants to do it at 6.30 on Monday, Jeremy cannot have him out there doing 7 to 7 
at one o'clock on, on Monday right now. I'm not going to authorize that. We're going to start small and make sure we do it right. Because this is only this is going to come down to one common denominator. One lazy supervisor that doesn't clean in between. One lazy supervisor that doesn't screen in between. You know, I just tested 876 dudes. Two came back positive. One had already self-isolated because he met the parameters. Another 19-year-old did not self-declare himself. His mom had COVID two weeks ago. And over the maintenance shop at Camp Ripley where he works, his supervisor had COVID. Now, that would probably tell you that maybe I should be careful. But he didn't. So now he tests positive. My point is, is that, and I'm going to be really strict on this, is that we're not opening the lens to everything I, it, right now. For the first two weeks, the first two weeks of June, let's make sure we do it right. Because the other thing we're doing is we're keeping habits. Habits to our students, habits to our student athletes, and habits to our coaches. This will be different. There's a reason you have the nursery. We're going to temperature scan kids. kids. And it, I, I don't want to take it off the rails, but I just want to make sure we're very careful. We're not opening the aperture to multiple things. And I'm not going to condone that we're going to do multiple things. We're going to do one thing and do one thing right. Please continue. I'll turn it over to Jeremy to talk about the strength and speed. Chip, um, I, I have some graphs as far as how we can map out for social distancing that I just emailed to you. I think you're presenting. I don't know if you can pull up maybe if you want to. Um, I'm pulling up. Okay. So, our strength and speed program, obviously, as Bill was saying, uh, if compared to summers in the past, would look very, very different this year. And COVID-19 is, is a different animal, and, and it's changing, as we've all already mentioned, kind of by the, by the day. Um, we feel that the, the parameters or the guidelines from the Minnesota Department of Health, as well as the high school, or excuse me, what the high school league is presenting to us from the National Federation, give us some pretty good guidelines that we can go by, similar to what we have done with, with Laker Legends or the school age child care as well that went on through the fourth quarter. Um, the difference in those two things versus what we would like to do is we are planning on keeping everything outdoors and using our outdoor facilities. Um, staying away from being in a gym with a, with a group of kids for strength and speed or even in the weight room, um, which obviously changes how we, how we would do our, our program. Um, myself, Trevor Solom, Nate Lund, Justin Viss, uh, Jason Weber kind of have been collaborating for the last month or so, not knowing what the future would hold for us to come up with something that we could do that would be essentially non-equipment based body weight type of movements um, for the strength portion and then focus on our, our same speed, agility and, and plyometric type movements that have always been done without any equipment. So um, in using the National Federation standards, or guidelines, I should say, we can have up to 40 people, including in a, including adults, but 40 total people on a football size, football field size area. So with our, our turf facility, as well as our two practice grass fields, we can accommodate a pretty large chunk of kids um, in, in those spaces. And um, what I was doing earlier this morning, and, and um, I went old school, I didn't do it on the computer, I did it on graph paper, but I just kind of give you an idea of what we what we plan to use as far as social distancing and stuff like that. So, with this would be what half of a football field would look like for some of our for some of our different things. And the closest that we have kids um, right now together, or the closest in proximity to a neighbor would be six yards, not six feet, but six yards. Um, and that's that's the, the smallest. A lot of times they're going to be fifteen to twenty yards apart from each other. Um, so we feel that we can we can supervise and, and coach with the small numbers that we'll have to have in those pods as well as make it beneficial for the kids to get some of that social interaction that they've all been kind of starving for just like us adults for the last couple months um, still make it competitive even though you might not be right next to your neighbor but you can still compete against your neighbor in this drill or that drill um, we can still collect data with timing things of that nature so that's, that's kind of um, what I was working on this morning is, is coming up with some of those maps that all of our coaches will know. There'll be cones out on the field and this is where athlete one through 18 stands for, for these two pods. Um, things things of, of that nature anyway. So I just wanna say, I wanna thank Bill because he put this together. The reason I'm being strict on this is because 
it's really important that all of our coaches, and Bill does a great job in, in enforcing this, but all of our coaches are still to the state high school rules. So what if we drift way away from it? Like, so yes, we want to go out baseball. Fully agree. If any of our baseball coaching staff goes out and actually tries to conduct any form of real baseball that does not meet the guidelines given by the state high school, they can be censored as coaches, and so can we as a school. So it's not that I don't want to do other things, but right now it's very strict. Do you agree, Bill? And so that's why we kind of want to just hold off so we don't get to anybody. Lots of people want to go do lots of things. Like, face it, I'm a wrestling guy. There will not be wrestling under it. The way the guidelines are written right now, there will be no wrestling. Wrestling, you cannot achieve social distance. We're not going to have masses, skin-to-skin contact. You know, so it is, the reason I'm being tight on this is for the first two weeks, when you're being put back on, we want to make sure we're tight and, and we're under the protocols we protect our coaching staff. Uh, Megan, do you want to make, talk about anything in regards to the virus portion of this and the preventative measures that we've talked about in these meetings? Not really, only that we're only we're just following MDH and CDC guidelines when it comes to screening and as more things come out, we'll just stay up to date and we'll go stricter or leaner as time goes on. Okay, questions? So there's a reminder, we don't use our, we're not using our locker rooms. Correct. 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 That's right, no locker room use. Talk, talk very briefly how this will work here as Say Tyson Meyer, I don't care. Say Tyson Meyer walks in to do this. How is it going to work for him? They'll start registering next week. Yeah, we'll probably start right if, if this is. Uh, if we'll, we'll start registering. We'll, we'll get we we'll get an email out to all the participants tomorrow through our coaches. Uh, that letter has already been been put together. Just needs to be sent out. Uh, they'll register. We'll have a uh, final registration numbers early next week. Uh, then we're going to sit down. Say we have a hundred. Say we have one hundred and fifty. Whatever the number is. And we have to sit down and put them in pods of nine. And uh, as, as uh, Chip mentioned and, and Jeremy was talking about, and obviously Megan's fully aware, uh, those, those pods at no time during the whole course of the next seven to eight weeks can intermix at any time, regardless of what's going on. Uh, that is crystal clear, and that's where we're at in that regard. So uh, we'll put them in the pods. They'll be notified sometime later next week uh, what their group is, when to report, the plan right now is to have them come in in two different doors because of the numbers, uh, and they'll be at, at different times, come in either door number one or door number 13. They'll have to have their temperature, temperature check, sign in, just like everybody who came into high school the last two and a half months during the school year. That was in during the day. Those same types of things. Uh, and from that point, they're turned over to the coaches uh, when they go through the temperature checks and check in, and we go through, through the process. Uh, you can use a bathroom, that's okay in a school, but you cannot use the locker room. So everything they come with, they, they have to go home with. Have to bring their own water bottles. Yeah, hold like their that. own water yeah. bottles. We can't turn the, the faucets on out there for them and stuff like that. So. I want to make this clear. It's my understanding that uh, speed and strength is going to be our sole uh, goal, at least through July 6th. We're going to focus on that, be great at that. Uh, all other activities will not be taking place on district properties, correct? Well, they will not be taking part on district properties, and if you're a, a coach under our employment, you're not off um, as we have right now under our, our lens. For, and two, we could revisit this in July 6th. There's lots of coaches out there that feel like they're all going to be doing something different. Common denominator is speed and strength for now. So we don't violate the state high school league guidelines and get our coaches in trouble. Any questions? Is that fair, Bill? Uh, right, yeah. I mean, uh, if, if we would have to, in order to do something, you know, uh, way, whether it be a different sport, obviously, like you said, wrestling is impossible. Uh, other activities could be, but they still have to be within those pods, and that, that would have to be worked through, and, and that's, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's going to be a scheduling nightmare. <laughs> it's a scheduling nightmare and a, and a really difficult process that, that we would have to look at very carefully. And when we can do that, we probably will do that as we move ahead, depending on how everything goes. But not until after July 6th. So right. there's lots of people that watch these work sessions, and anybody in the world can watch these work sessions. So let me be very clear. We're following the National Federation. If I go to the very top here, they'll put this very articulately. We're following these guidelines here. These are the protocols, copy and paste with Bill right from the National Federation and the Minnesota State High School. These emphasis are the ones that are given to us. This isn't Bill making stuff up, correct, Bill? Correct. 
copy and paste it. Uh, where it starts being ours is how we start getting down here, phase one, and how this is going to be applied. And just so we know right now, the common denominator for all of our summer athletes is speed and strength. And I know some people like to do more, but right now in state high school, it's very strict. And so if you do anything outside of this, you could be censured. So if Jeremy wanted to go coach Nate Rankin in baseball and started something, and he's a, one of our baseball coaches, he can get himself in trouble. Now, if it's something totally outside of Minnewaska, if Nate Rankin joined, you know, Jeremy's baseball, that's Jeremy, right? He doesn't have anything to do with us for coaching baseball. And if Jeremy wanted to take a traveling league and cruise around, as long as he's not using our email system and soliciting kids to his official as a school district, there's things he can do, but you have to be very careful because the state high school is watching this closely. And honestly, we don't want to screw this up so we get cold down. Yeah, we, we don't want to end up, do, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we don't want to lose, lose what we start. And obviously, the, 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 we want to keep everybody safe. We want to keep every kid safe. Um, and the reason it's tight is because if Nate Rankin goes to Florida, he comes back and he has symptoms. His whole pod gets knocked out if he comes to speed and strength for 14 days. Correct. And that's one of the reasons we, we you know, we, we divide into pods and why the, all the health organizations are, are consistently we do that. Because if it does happen, you know, those nine are knocked out and maybe the supervisor, but the rest of them would not necessarily have to have to go that route. But if you're all, if you're intermixing, intermingling, then it's everybody. Then you have a complete mess that way. Pretty clearly. So we'd like to do more things, but right now, um, the state basically doesn't want us to allow us. These are the guidelines. This is what we're going to try to do um, for the next two weeks, starting July 15th. Okay, questions. something. Any questions or comments amongst the board members? So if it's if it's June, you know, June 15th for for the start of speed and strength, and we're looking at the state high school league for you know the July 6th portion of it or whatever. If it's, you know, I'm looking at like a lot of the, the youth stuff has started, you know, like youth baseball, like, I like the practicing down at Barsness Park and certain aspects there. So I, my question is, is how about like other not related to Minnesota State High School League, you know, for, for some of the summer stuff? You know, what, what, what's our date we're looking at that for, you know, Chip, for, for our facilities? If it's not high school related. <laughs> Our high school league. Well, right? As long as we're not covering it, we would need to check it. We would say, like, so let's just go back. Say John Goldberg starts a baseball league. I, I don't know. We'd have to check with our our insurance to say, can, can Jeff Goldberg summer league have nothing that has nothing to do with the school other than kids that go to school here? Not covered by the state high school league. Not covered. You, what I understand is you can rent our facility. We just have to make sure that under these these conditions that we can do that because that's what we worked on last year around the community at. So I just don't know how they stand on that um, by you inviting them in. I, I, so that's why I need to check. That's why Barsons Park is cool, right? Because it has nothing to do with us. That's My wife drove by there yesterday and said, uh, so why aren't, why can't our kids, why, how come kids get to do that? And, you know, it has nothing to do with us. So I, I believe that's, I, I believe what it is, we just have to validate if, if somebody approaches us to rent our facilities, can we? And when do you get to vacate the rules? Like, Parsons rules would be the city of Huntley, right? Yeah. I mean, when, does, when do we not have to follow any state? I don't know, I think the only time is when you're a sanctuary activity for us.
just want to think, you know, I, Bill Dutchman, I just want to work on this. Jeremy, all of them. I just want to make sure that everybody who watches this, listen, we're going to have one common denominator. We're going to do it well. We're going to follow the basic league guidelines. It may not be as much as many people would like, but it's the start to getting back to normal. So watch this very closely. Nothing changes between June 15th and July 6th. It wasn't like July 7th, the floodgates open. But I do think, like Bill mentioned earlier, maybe some guidelines change after the 4th of July. Um, but uh, we'll continue to adjust as, as necessary. And there is no, as far as I know, there has been no official ball force. So I can see what those kids have to they're, they're producing staff, they're, they're, they're having some real trouble, so they don't know if it's going to be there. But I'm sure you haven't heard either. There's no decision on both of these. No, no, they, the only date I've heard is that whatever decision is made will have to be made by August 7th. That's about as late as they can go making a decision for the fall. Second or seventh? Seventh. And what we don't know here, um, I would also make it very clear what we did last spring with being our coaches, it would be very clear that we had until fiscal year and we transitioned the budget in. If we know ahead of time we're not having activities, we're not going to spend. Jeremy is going to have the authority to go and spend his football budget. We're not going to pay all of our football coaches. We're going to be facing deficits in 21. And it's not because I don't want to, not because you're not great people, but if we don't have activities, we have to approach it all differently. Um, we'll get that in the budget. But just so as I have Bill here, because we've discussed that before, right, Bill? Correct. Correct. So. Well, thank you, folks. I appreciate All right. it. All right, let's uh, move on to the uh, budget uh, 2020 revisions, or I guess final. Vicki, you have the, the main seat. I don't need the main seat. You have the stuff to project. I'm going to hand them some paper. Which one first, Vicki? Well, FY20. Just uh, my notes. I'm handing them the Gatsby's 84 sheet. You're just projecting the estimated, the other spreadsheet with all the other information. So they're getting the notes from me that I sent you the uh, the Word documents. Yep. So you can see this one here. You can see 29th May 20. It says June 3rd, 2020 work session, FY20 budget revision. That word document is what I just gave them. And I gave them the spreadsheet on the Gatsby 84. So I did not give them that first spreadsheet I sent you this morning. Okay. Am I projecting the right sheet? That Would this be helpful you on the word? I can't see it. You're not presenting, no. You're not presenting. Ooh, you present. That's 21. Mm -hmm. So that's Vicki's hand off some sheets. That one, that, that's not the one. Yes, that's the one you should present. That's really small. What they have is my notes to talk about where the increases were, decreases were. Yeah, it's the 84 that's going to impact their unreserved fund balance. One year to the next. I'm going to just shrink this up a hair more. Um, long story short, as we close out 2020, FY20, you can start to see, um, you see a couple of things. Well, first of all, if you look across, you can see that overall our unrestricted fund balance will go up. Um, 114.370, or did you are you looking at the worksheet of 106.421? We've got the worksheet. No, you don't have that. You guys don't have the paper on that. That's just only on the screen. Because okay. this isn't the final one. You, there may be revisions on the 15th. This is just a discussion. This is as good as I can get today. Yeah, so what's normally going to happen is we don't really close the books on 20 FY20 until like August, September. There are things that continue to happen, but as a result, the things we did do is we, we looked at how we could get our, I would say overall, we built a budget last year on 1260. Our average enrollment was adjusted to 1270. 
So our average daily membership throughout last year was 1270. We built the budget on 1260. So we had 10 more kids on average that attended school last year than we budgeted. So um, that's a key number. So 1260, we, we got paid on 1270. Because we didn't have as much sub cost, because we didn't have to use as much staff development, um, we didn't have to spend as much on transportation because we, you know, we trimmed some days. Um, we did have to spend $25,000 on the general fund to bail out fund for community ed. And there's still charges coming in for refunds to like New York City um, summer programs. Fund seven, no change. And fund 22, all that looks, the only thing you have to understand with that is that, that's misleading. Those are student activity accounts. Those are not, those are restricted. That is really, that's just a thing that a law has changed that has to take them out of the general fund. Um, overall, when it looks at salary fringe, we had a decrease of 101,000. That's because we made some cuts last year that we kept. Um, you can see all the, all those pieces there um, when you look at it. And then you can see we spent more money in maintenance Obviously, with the pool, um, raid was increased just because when you, you start having raid, um, depends on what students come here, those costs increase. This was a big one. This was one that went really high last year was that sub pay. So obviously, we had a you know we had a reduction. And then obviously, having distance learning, we didn't spend as much in supplies. But one thing that we have to really keep an eye on as we close out 20 is. We, we're starting to see more kids PSEO, and there is a real cost for offering all the college and schools courses. The, the tuition that we bills we get are extremely high, and so that's a fifty thousand dollar increase. And so we're trying to get a handle of that. That's kids that go to PSEO. Those are kids that their tuition costs we have to pay. Vicky, anything you want to touch on twenty? Well, the other soft item, which um, MA billing. The Department of Human Services has already told districts that they would recommend they stop billing MA because MA rates are going to go down from the, the rates that they gave us to use. So we've stopped submitting as of the end of November. So from July through November, we've paid back the 62500 and some dollars that when they rebuild 18 that we owed them. And we've only brought in 32,808. So in this budget revision so far, I've reduced our estimated um, MA dollars to 150. Now keep in mind last year at this time when we presented a budget for FY20, we still had 300,000 for MA. Then we talked later in work sessions that we were going to reduce it to 200 after we got that $62,000 bill. And now I'm hoping for 150. DHS has not said when they're going to give us their new amended rate. The issue is we can bill up to a year later. She could bill December 2019 out in November of 2020 and we'd still get paid. So they're still working with DHS to get the final rates. So, if we don't get more than the 32,000, then this budget we see of 114, I'm, that's not gonna hold because we won't have the revenue. I have 150,000 in MA in this budget, FY20 budget as revenue. I'm not saying that's gonna happen. Um, our biller is gonna talk to me again tomorrow. She was trying to reach Department of Human Services today and didn't get any answers yet. So Andrea, Andrea Gullickson has been on top of this, constantly in touch with them, trying to get information out of them as to when she should start rebilling. I don't know if, I mean, we could easily tell her, I don't want that authority, but we could tell her, go ahead and bill at the rate we have, and we'll worry about the deficit later. I would like some direction to do that. I mean, we could legally do that. They, DHS didn't say you can't, they're just saying that the rate we gave you as an interim rate is high. And so... So the reality is we just bill at a later time. We either bill at a later time or we bill at the rate we do or we, we continue to wait a little while to see if they're going to give us new rates.
you know. Do you remember that Doug, uh, remember DHS had a, had a bad year? So yeah. they lost a ton of money, but not this year, but obviously last year when all the tobacco went to DHS. So that's one of the concerns is they can't pay all the bills that they originally were, we're, you know, we budgeted for. That's why normally this isn't like a new thing where they're reducing rates. This is something we've adjusted with over the years, but this is a different scenario, I think, in many ways, which is why maybe we should consider delaying the billing. But Ted, I'm, I'm a little behind on the discussion and maybe I'll get a little bit of a follow-up after the meeting when we have more time, but I, I guess I'm wondering why we wouldn't send the bill right away because it kind of proves a point too, right? I mean, if I understand it correctly at this point, they were projecting X amount of dollars. Therefore, you were gonna send that amount of bill. Those are numbers that they're telling you. You had zero control over it all. I mean, it'd be kind of like me telling somebody, I'll give you this much for rent. I'll rent it. Chad, you were at the table, but I beat you. So now it gets down to it. Now, for whatever reason, I go to this Chad and say, yeah, actually, I told you I was gonna pay you that, but I'm not gonna. Why? I don't know. I'm just not gonna. So if they're coming up with numbers, they should probably live with them. I'm kind of looking at it as kind of a, if I believe it right in my mind, kind of unfunded mandate. You know, they're telling you you gotta do this, we're gonna do that, but then in the end, they never do, so you're just out on a limb doing everything. My question is, is what's gonna make them toe the line next year if everybody's holding off to send the bill and there's really, you know, what are the repercussions to them? You see what I mean? They haven't mandated that we do stop. They haven't sent a letter that says stop billing. They just recommend because they know that the rate will go down. At least at our day treatment, we've not had been able to provide group sessions. So the number of minutes we can report <laughs> under the minute system is going to be <laughs> way down because we don't have enough minutes. And how DHS comes up with their estimated interim rate, I don't know. They take a look at minutes from prior years and they average. So they've given us a rate that we use as interim. And like it, in um, December 2019, they did the settle up for FY18 so they're always a year behind. So they're not they're not saying we won't accept your bills, we won't pay you. They're just saying they're encouraging districts to wait until they get a better idea what the actual rate's going to be. But in saying that, I want you to understand that we only have thirty-two thousand dollars. That's not even enough to cover the cost of our actual biller. Uh, the revenues project one hundred and fifty to get you to that one fourteen. Any dollars we don't get of that 150, which right now there's a difference of 40, to, that's a difference of $100,000, you're not gonna have 114 as a fund balance. And I get the theory of what you're talking about, Ted, that ultimately, why should we have to make a budget under assumptions that they're supposed to be guaranteed or somewhat promised, and yet we know that it's not going to be true. I just don't like billing budgets, knowing that they're not giving an accurate budget. I, that's the only thing, because I, I worry about the fact that we're over projecting revenues and for many reasons. But and I only moved that. Yeah. I only moved that one fifty into next year as well. That's all I have in the twenty one. Okay. You're going to see. So, Mr. Parsons, if we continue to bill at the current rate and we know it's it's higher, wouldn't it be better for us to have a surplus? That we what do we do with the surplus money? Do we just give it back to them at the end of the uh, They would rebuild it by December of December 15th, or it's by the 15th of December usually in a normal thing. December 2015, 2020, they would rebuild FY19 at the rate <laughs> that they developed. So they wouldn't, we're in 20 right now. They won't rebuild 20 until December of 21. That's how far behind it gets. You know, and special ed's a year behind for what we spend this year where you just don't get alive. I just want you to be aware, I, I want some guidance. It's before they kind of told them that we prefer you guys don't, I just said, well, let's bill through 
when we head school mm -hmm. and then worry about it. But then when they yeah. just said they got in that direction. Yes, is we should just go all the way through, but that's a soft number. But I think what it's going to inform us is that we're going to, it's very provisional. We're going to have to look at potential staffing reductions that win. If we can't claim minutes for a group because of, you know, distance learning, those are minutes that truly don't earn us revenue. If we're not earning revenue, then that's where it comes out of fund balance. And I know that overall, just arenas, wind programs still made money, correct, last year? Yeah. The key. But it probably, if, if it, needs, oh. it may not make money this year because of this, but I don't know yet. We don't have final numbers. My point is, like, lots of people have lots of different ideas because when you hear this, why don't we just close wind? Well, one, it'd be very difficult to do with maintenance of effort and all the other things are going on, but typically win always is self-sustaining. What you do is you can charge things off in special ed and not MA. It's just, I don't want to say a shell game, but you, you used to get over, you used to get over north of $600,000 a year in third party billing. That, those were the good days that they don't exist like they used to. And DHS has been in trouble, so. I think what we will be looking at, and we have reviewed the contract, we can make reductions all the way up to, you know, the middle of August, and we're going to watch this very closely. So one thing I would say, if we look at 21, knowing we can't do, we can't click minutes on group, we may look at some staffing changes. Well, should we look all at I, A year from now, we could be facing the, uh, the same problem. Should we look at the 21? So 21, the very first thing is, if you look over here, you built the budget on 1280. That 1280 is because we have 80 seniors coming out, we're gonna have 88 kindergartners coming in. Obviously that's a soft number, but that's what we project. We also project, um, we are, these are the bigger numbers that are coming in from like Glacial Hill. So last year we budgeted 1260, we got paid on 1270, this year we estimate we're going to build a budget on 1280. We think it should be in the 1295 to 1300 um, total enrollment. So that's the first number for the people grant. That number just gets plugged in. That that number gets plugged in, and that tells you right here. Can you All that, that number is 1280 times what we get in total revenue per our ADM. So. Chip, can you make that resolution? Hey Chip, can you make that just a pitch bigger, please? Because they don't, I didn't do the printout for them. I thought you'd show it on screen, so why make paper? Because they'll see the final one on the 15th with the real that? budget numbers. That's good. Thank you. Perfect. Because there again, if they decide to make changes, like if they didn't want us to build it on 1280, that's going to change by the 15th. If they did want further reductions, that would change it by the 15th. So I can tell you, like, going down the budget, one thing we did is, you know, I, I reduced staff development um, just because right now we know there's going to be a shift in revenues coming in. Um, I reduced some of the capital expenditures, even though it shows a, a negative balance. That's because we bought devices early this year because I believe there'll be some form of distance learning. So that's a big difference here is we're going to buy budgets that come out of the tech levy. Um, but we bought them early, so we'd have them because we got a rich rate. Um, if you come down here, uh, one of the things we're looking at is we also budgeted that we're likely going to have poor retirement. So obviously you're going to have that money and then you're going to take out that unfunded suffering. You're going to have to take out um, the pay for items because uh, our final fall, we believe that it could be as many as four going next spring. Uh, LTFM, we've been going along. You know, one thing is, is when we pull up LTFM dollars, it's just that, you know, we've been making a lot of improvements. We switched out of Florida this year, it was $100,000. Um, we had a lot of pool expenses. Right now we're doing asbestos removing, doing carpeting. So that, these can stay, everything that can be in deficit is in deficit. What can be in deficit has been fixed, at least be zero. Um, one concern we'd say is at the very end of the day, um, 
you're going to see our fund wind, and that's our general fund will increase $313,000 because we're getting 2% more from the state next year. We also have more kids. Fund two, transportation will increase. Fund four, community ed should increase. Um, that depends on how this looks. Our workman's comp had an increase, so um, we just renewed our insurance. Um, our insurance went down by 10 grand. That's not true. We, instead of getting a 5% overall increase, uh, Joe at Lowry was able to work with us. Our workman's comp went up, but our our other insurance was able, he was able to hold it tight just so we wouldn't have such a steep increase. Ray, because we have a new student coming into our building, um, which I've not talked about on the internet here, so that's why I'm not sharing with you. You should anticipate that's going to cost us $74,000 by him coming here. Um, you don't have a right to change that. Maintenance, we had to increase it just because you're going to see there are a number of things we have to continue to do. Um, I put ninety. I put so I have one hundred thousand dollars. I dropped that by to ninety thousand, just so we have curriculum. Um, these are the things that you'll see. So the general fund increase before fifteen. However, when you come over here and you plug into what we're going to spend, those concerns. So what this reflects is staff cuts. So we've not hired anybody. So like the elementary, we had two people retire. We are not. We are not. We are not hiring new. The only one, we're not hiring any new in anything. In fact, we took a dean, put him back in the classroom. Um, we still have an this money coming next year, so that's why Brian's staying. We're not gonna have two full-time teachers and just title, we'll use some this money. Um, you're gonna see in the elementary, the two retirees, there's a dean going in. You also have two elementary teachers, one left, one, one resigned. So you can see that we've had four elementary teachers leave, but we did not hire anybody on. Now, we, we do believe we'll have to hire one, just because you know you can cut it up to a certain point. There'll be a paraprofessional reduction that'll be announced here in the next two weeks. Um, and so what we're doing is trying to decrease our costs, obviously, by personnel. And that, that's how we got to zero over here. So I took a 10%, 10 thousand dollar reduction from um, curriculum, I took a $10,000 cut from building and maintenance, and I took a $10,000 cut from activities. Um, I haven't got a chance to talk to Bill about it, but what will that look differently? Um, so I'm going to ask the activities community to come together in the next month. Um, we're going to have to take a look at how we can cut. We have more coaches than really our numbers suggest that we have to have, and then Bill and I have talked about it. This might be a year we can't buy new uniforms. Um, I just the uncertainty of this year we have to be really careful. Bill, I, think we'll, we'll, I did talk 21. to Bill about activities. So right now we just took it out of the general supply act line in activities. That general supply line is where state participation goes. Until you guys get a chance to decide, because I know you're you're discussing coaches to athletes percentages. So right now that's the line. Uh, again, I used the 150000 for MA dollars in this budget that we may, may change depending on what you guys say now. We also have um, a special ed van on order that was supposed to have been here already. Now they're telling Angie because of COVID, we, they hope to get it to us in August. We're buying that with federal dollars, not this budget. And with the purchase of that van, and um, how CHIP is hoping to shape how we transport special ed students with then all of the vans we have using pair of drivers. There's a meeting he's hoping to have in August. Uh, we're moving, instead of a budget of $345,000 for special ed transportation in this budget for 21, we reduced it to 280. If he in fact can do the majority of the transporting of the special ed staff with the vans we have, that will even be reduced more significantly. I just think right now, I don't think we dare take it below that. Current in the FY20 budget, even with how Palmer billed us, we did pay 270, just under 275,000 for special ed transportation with their vans. That's why I left it at about 280, but they are looking, CHIP is looking at a way of having pairs drive and using our vans. The vans are used a lot, I'm told, for activities for tennis, and that's an issue where golf 
during those seasons. So I don't know if we can completely get away from that. <coughs> but the issue is we don't want Palmer coming into fall if we go into distance learning for any reason saying, well, no, you promised these routes to us. That's what we ended up paying this year, mm -hmm. you know, based on this average, we've got to pay me anyway deal. Mm -hmm. So he, He's already talked, I don't know if a date's been set in August, but Chris Champlin agreed, Chip, didn't he, that there should be a meeting yeah. to discuss that. Well, and and Palmer, Palmer, said that Palmer's getting dialed up here, so we'll see how long I'm getting it. I'm, I'm sure they got a really good person coming in. Uh, Palmer yeah, just the sent us another bill. Go from Starbucks. Um, and so, you know, we were able to, we had federal carrier money we had to spend. So I'm guessing Ted's over there shaking his head right now. How the hell can you talk about being upside down and then you gotta spend hundred thousand dollars? It doesn't make sense that this is called special ed. And so there are certain things you have to do. So we opted upon it again. Uh, and what we're gonna do is park it at wind so there's no inter-district transportation. The other thing is with special ed transportation, that's one of the main reasons we have an E3 principal. Okay, listen, 45% of our 45 kids that are four-year-olds qualify for special ed. That's like 50%. The average in Minnesota is like 13%. And so when we give everybody special transportation, yes, that's really cool to do that. But that's how you get $280,000 or uh, special transportation that it is not fully funded. So then you have to cross load all your general fund. That's why money is so tight. There's two things. I mean, one, um, it's our spread rates high. And so we have a lot of services we provide. And so it's just expensive. And then the second thing is, it's, you know, um, it, we uh, we have to subsidize a lot of things that are not fully funded. So when you have 20% sped and you're cross subsidizing, it, it comes out of that. The, the third thing is, is out of the main campus that you guys are sending right now, people don't turn their previous lunch points in. So we get less um, extra money for people that probably already qualified. So those are the things we're working on. So one is, we have a new van that we ordered uh, from a new shop in the but it's getting retrofitted in Maple Grove or something. It should already be here. It'll be available in the fall, and we'll have a lot more special ed transportation in general. So this budget, just so everybody knows, this budget that you're seeing tonight, we still have to make some cuts. So, you know, I believe we'll hire one elementary teacher between now and uh, the first of the school year. The second thing is, is if we have another elementary teacher leave, Brian Gruber is phenomenal, but Brian Gruber will go back in the classroom and we'll, we'll just we'll just solve that win um, and find a way to pay access other ways. Um, so there'll be, you know, one thing I've told Angie, any board meeting here again, any 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 additions will be in the red. Right? And so you have to truly scrutinize, and I'll be here too, but right now I'd be sleeping in Africa, but I'll talk to her very extensively. As, you know, as board members, this next fiscal year, you're going to just have to watch it very closely because you're going to see like, see like meal costs, transportation costs. Um, if we do some form of hybrid, I can only imagine if we did half and half our transportation costs being skyrocket more. I, I don't know. We just have to watch it very closely. So the first thing is, any questions about our numbers? Is everyone okay with 1280? It's still a conservative number. I think we've had discussions about this, and um, I'm glad it's conservative. <clears throat> I probably would have preferred it even more conservative, but I'm comfortable with where we're at. Well, you can put 1270 in it, but then that means we've got to generate out $120,000 worth of costs. So we got to just let people know the next month. And you can't cut any more teachers because, you know, contract so we have already planned them on May 1st. So it would all have to be support staff. Professionals, practitioners, support staff. And second thing is, is like uh, on staffing, we're, our target number is eight pairs. I'll say it publicly now. Uh, well, it's we not seven. an easy thing to do, but um, in order to make this work, that's what eight pair reductions. The next reductions will be in mental health professionals and mental health practitioners. We'll have to review that. <clears throat> this, this allows 
one and higher of an elementary teacher just because of the amount of people leaving. We will need to hire more people to come back. And so we'll have to hire somebody in that position. There is a position to hire an English because, you know, Ms. Tyree Swenson submitted a lot of resignations about the hiring English teacher. And, you know, we can, I think one thing we'll have to watch very closely is if there's no activities, we'll have to take a look at how we do that. If there's no community ed, how we're going to look at that. Yeah, just have to watch real closely. I appreciate the work you both put into this and all your administrative team. So thank you. Any questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Do I tell Andrea to go ahead and bill or not? Yes. Tell her to bill at the rate we gave her. Okay. And tell schools out because you can imagine if we don't and then they know it's sitting out there, how many school districts will do it, they'll think they have already solved their balance. And I think there'll just be less money a year from now than there is now. So I'll tell her to move forward with billing using the interim rates we were assigned by DHS last summer. We just know that if we have 150, we may get 120, have to pay 30 back. But at least we'll have the money in the bank. So it's not 100, you know, a year from now because they're out of money. Good point. Okay. I'll tell her tomorrow to bill away. All right. Let's move on to the first read of student handbooks. Turn over to policy. I am. Mic's off. Your mic is up, Ann. Hello. Mike. Thank you. There you go. All right. Yeah, we reviewed those. Um, Sarah Sippy was present to, I guess, the handbook says the next part, but uh, the policies, those are all straight MSBA policies. There are no changes to ours or from the state, so we propose that we adopt those. You're referring to item 11? Yes. Let's, uh, let's move on to, uh, Sarah, you want to speak to the handbooks? Um, yes, so we are working to create a new intermediate handbook, which we took the high school handbooks to get a frame of reference. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of strikers, so if you go through it, there's 48 pages. That's not what it will be. We'll delete a lot of it. That doesn't make sense for fourth through eighth grade. Um, we also reviewed a couple other middle schools to try to see, make sure that we had everything that we needed. And then we also took what was in our elementary, which was a K-6, to make sure that we had then recovered as well. And so we took really a large amount of handbooks to try to condense down and see what we need for four through eight. It is not perfect, and we will learn a lot this year, um, but feel that we have a good um, document going forward. There are um, uh, there is a matrix in all of our doc in all of our handbooks, which is the elementary, the intermediate, and the high school. That is a behavior piece, and so those are the same across the board. So if a student um, is caught with a weapon, we know exactly how to respond in all areas. We're trying to make them as uniform as possible. Um, same with a lot of our nursing things. Uh, after the first reading, there's a few things to clean up, and so we'll work on cleaning that up after tonight. And then the next one that you read, we'll have all the strikethroughs gone, and will be just a full handbook of what it will look like in its final form. Okay. Very well. Um, do we want to move forward with the uh, reading the first reading of the staff handbook? That is not me. Is that it? Are you support staff or are you, there is a current 9 through 12 handbook that I think we were tabling until July, but the staff, there's a so support staff. So I'm there's just two things. Uh, I think there's competing versions of this, the handbook for the school, uh, the high school handbook. Uh, I have not got a chance to review that and uh, I'm just going to table that until July. Okay. I want to thank Corey and his BLT, Square to Parts. We'll take a look at that again in July. And then there shouldn't be a 912 faculty handbook. We have one faculty, we have licensed teachers, and we have support staff. And so um, that will be struck. We need to have one consistent handbook. Because from my personal community, you know that it happens. When you have different handbooks for elementary, for secondary, it doesn't go well. We need one certified handbook. So I'll be looking at that here next week. Okay, very well. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Chip. Um, moving on to item 11, anyone have any questions regarding these? Any further discussion items or any other items? Any other items? We've referred the announcements with the upcoming board meetings. The one meeting I did have a question regarding is the one in J July, which I think July 15th is a Wednesday. 